Well, I want you to turn to the book that everybody in this sanctuary has memorized. Said no one ever. Turn to the book of Job in the Old Testament. It's relatively easy to get to. It's right before Psalm, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, all that. Right before the Psalms. And Psalms is real easy to get to. You can just take your Bible, put your finger right in the middle, right in the middle, and just split it with your finger. And it's going to land in the Psalms. No, we probably don't have every word of Job memorized. It's 42 chapters. And... Uh, a lot of dialogue there, but a lot of, I mean, I mean, truly, and you'll see this morning, I'll, I'll show you in case when I say this, you think, well, that's stretching a little bit. I, truly, the whole Word of God, including the gospel, you'll see, is wrapped up in this book. Now, what's so amazing about that? It, it falls into the category, if you're putting categories on the word. I mean, there's the law and the prophets, and then there's the wisdom literature right in the middle. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. That, that's generally called in theological circles the wisdom literature. Yeah. I mean, it's the word of God, but there's an awful lot of wisdom and application of life all in there. Well, Job is all about the application of the word of God to life, how to live when the world crashes in on you, how to live when we're walking in Satan's world and Satan himself takes from you. What do we do? How do we respond? Most people go through all the stages of grief, or at least parts of them. They're all there in the book of Job. Wow. Other things, too. I'll tell you what else is there, but first let me tell you this about the book of Job. It has the distinction of being one of, and some scholars say the, but let's just say one of to be a little more accurate right now since nobody really knows exactly, but one of the oldest books known to humanity. We have some earlier writings and scribblings and little fragments of writings, but the book of Job as a book is one of the very oldest there are three or four others that fit in that category as well, too, and you read about those. But the thing about the book of Job is that it's found in the Word of God and no other place as far as in a collection. Like, it's not in any other, other of the religious books of the world. It's in the Word of God. That might be because it speaks of Yahweh Elohim. It speaks of the creation by the hand of Yahweh. It speaks of the B'nai Elohim, Hebrew, the sons of God, the children of God, the angelic realm, being in His presence while He breathed into the nostrils of Adam when He created the heavens and the universe and the angels sang for joy. All of that's in there. A lot more too. So there's a lot of theology, if you will. There's spiritual warfare in there pictured for you. There are practical applications to pain and grief and suffering. Responses that are completely appropriate to make and those that are inappropriate. And it doesn't shake its finger in your face. You just read it and you realize that was not appropriate. Yet, we hear people say these things all the time, even today, thousands and thousands and thousands of years later. To be the oldest book, I'm, and if I say that, you know, one of, I could say that. To, to be the oldest book in the world, known to humanity, that's a pretty practical word for us, huh? The gospel of salvation is there. Jesus Christ is there. You'll see. For those of you that have read it 10, 15 times, say, I don't remember any of that. It's there. You'll see. So it is a book of theology that is helping us to understand things about creation and spiritual warfare and all those topics. It is that. But what most people like about it is, is that it is a book that deals with the real stuff of life. 
Now, life was different thousands and thousands of years ago. Listen, listen, the book of Job is quoted 65 times in the Old Testament. 65 times by the Psalms. David wrote most of those. By the Proverbs, Solomon wrote most of those. I mean, that goes back to 1,000 B.C. And we know that the ancients before that had it. 65 times. It's, it, it's quoted in the prophets. Many of the prophets quote Job. Psalms, Proverbs, the prophets. James actually names Job by name. He doesn't just quote him. He says, and Job is an example of the patience that we tr need to try to display before the Lord. I'm paraphrasing, but he, used, he, he says Job's name. So to be the oldest book on the planet, it's had an effect. It's had an impact on people's lives for thousands and thousands of years. So much so, of course, obviously, the Holy Spirit of God put under anointing whoever wrote that and put under the hearts of the people collecting together what they knew to be truth and to be the Word of God and that spoke truly about God into what we call the canon, the, the collection of the Old Testament and even the New Testament. It really is an amazing book. Very seldom read by most people because some of it's tough to read because it's about the stuff of life that hurts. But the answers are there. The perspective is there. The attitudes that we strive for are there because we see that God blesses in those, even in the midst of Satan's world. You say, Carl, why are you preaching this this morning? I'm going to do an overview of the book of Job. Aren't you glad I'm not preaching chapter by chapter today? <laughs> You'll think so by the time I finish. But we're just going to look at little blurbs from a lot of the chapters. And, but you're going to see some amazing stuff, and I'm looking forward to taking this journey with you. I'm preaching it because it connects in the end of it all. It connects. It connects with what I preached last week from Philippians 3. Forget what's behind Stress on, strain on in Jesus Christ towards the goal that drives us heavenward with a heavenly view towards the goal of walking in Jesus Christ. And you remember, Paul said, if you can take such a view of things, if you can understand, let me paraphrase, Paul says in Philippians 3, if you can understand you're living in Satan's world, if you can get that, which means even to good people, bad and sometimes terrible things will happen. Satan will see to it. Why didn't God intervene in every single case? He has intervened. He is coming back. All things will be made new. Everything will be made right. Everything Satan stole from you will be given back to you in God's perfect way and in his perfect timing. You will see that is the promise of his word. That's why he said, I am coming back. I, that's why he went to the cross. That's why he rose from the grave. You can give the Lord a hand. You can say amen if you want. So, I'm not going to give you a bunch of platitudes this morning and pretty little words. And I'm just, we're going to deal with life. We're going to run right into it. It's going to slap us in the face. The book of Job. One of the oldest books known to humanity. Still speaking powerfully to God's people today. Still exalting Jesus. Still exalting the God of creation. Reminding us. That God had a creation of beings created in his image before he created this, the angelic realm. They're known in Hebrew as the B'nai Elohim, usually translated into English in the scriptures as the sons of God or sometimes just the angels, the angels. And the word sons means sons and daughters. It means children. It's just, it's, a, it's an endearing and exalted way of, of referring to the whole body of those that know and love the Lord. The B'nai Elohim. The Hebrew translation of John chapter 1, I've said this many times before. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and I skip a few ahead a little bit. And it says, and then that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And all who believed in Him, that's Jesus, the Word that became flesh, was given the right to be called, in Hebrew, B'nai Elohim again. The sons of God, the children of God. 
mm. with our divine nature being restored. It means we were like Adam and Eve. We were not, they were not supposed to die. They were supposed to have perfect fellowship with God and had it until they disobeyed him. But all of that is restored at Calvary's cross. Amen. We come under the blood, not because we're perfect people or the chosen ones. We come under the blood because we chose him. He chose the way to pay for our sin. And we said, yes, I received that way. Thank you, Lord. Tuta Arunai. Thank you, Lord. Job says all of that and so much more. Now, since we're going to scoot through just portions of it to make the bigger points I want to make here this morning, um, I, I encourage you, go, go home sometime, maybe today, but before this week is out, read the whole book. It really, there's 42 chapters, but it, it, it doesn't take very long. You can read through the whole book. There's some amazing stuff, stuff I won't even be able to get to. There's some funny stuff in there. I mean, mo most of you know he's got three friends. We'll talk about them in a moment. And they, they all, once he starts his suffering, and you know, which is horrible, they all have some advice for him. Some of it's hilarious. Oh, they don't know they're funny, and they're not trying to be funny. In fact, Job even gets on to one of them kind of in a sideways manner. You'll see he talks about, yeah, he said, these people that you know, spout platitudes and, you know, think they know the mind of God. And he said, they just really aggravate me. And the guy he's talking to, I, th I think it was Bill Dad, he steps up and he says, you talking about me, boy? I mean, it doesn't say that, but it does say that. And when you read, you can, you can sense kind of the, the humor that's there, but yet this is how we converse with each other now. You're going to run right into his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Sufar. You'll read about them. You'll hear about them. Let's set this tone. We're going to go right in to Job chapter 1. Verse 6. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. And what that says is, and one day, the B'nai Elohim came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered, Yahweh from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. What he says in Hebrew is from going shuwat. That's the word that Daniel uses in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, when the angel tells him, Sealed up, seal up this vision, because in the last days, many will go shuwat. That word many is rab in Hebrew, and it means uncountable multitudes of people will go shuwat. And knowledge will rabah, exponentially increase. Guess which generation is the only generation to see that? Hundreds of thousands of people in the air right now over us, going all over the world 24-7. Millions and millions. Half the population of the planet, that number, will be in the air within the next year. There are 8 billion people on the planet. I would say rab is going shuat. Rabah, wouldn't you? Many uncountable multitudes going over the face of the earth. Exponentially, knowledge is increasing. Technology. I just want you to know that's the word there. Because when he asks Satan, where have you been? Where have you gone? In Hebrew, it says shuat. Been all over the face of the earth. The Bible also says God's eyes go shuat throughout the earth. He knows every thought. Of humanity. Just wanted to give you some context there, some linguistic context and how it matches up with other scriptures in its meaning. But he says, I've been going all over the earth. See, Satan is arrogant. He thinks he legally owns it because of Adam and Eve basically giving it to him in the garden. So, after that, verse 8. Then Yahweh said to Satan, Satan is a Hebrew word, 
It means the adversary. Have you considered my servant Job? Since you've been all over the earth, you've, there's no one on earth like him. He's a blameless man and upright. Doesn't mean he doesn't struggle with sin or have bad thoughts or whatever, but he, he really loves God with his heart. He said, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? I don't know about y'all, but I love knowing that often God has his hedge around me. I, just a little personal thing. That it's just an illustration of this. I spent almost 10 years in law enforcement in Florida. You know that. Two different sheriff's offices under three different sheriffs. And I, I had people tell me all the time because I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be dramatic. I'm just going to tell you the truth. It, my wife knows it, and it's documented in my records. I should be dead now multiple times over. And I had people tell me over the years, Things like, man, God's got his angels around you. You walked through a bear trap, and you didn't even know it was there. And on and on and on. I've heard things like that. So I understand about the hedge of protection. It doesn't mean that nothing ever happens to me or that nothing bad ever comes my way or even heartbreaking. But it means overall in the bigger picture, God is preserving and protecting my life and yours as you love him and serve him. Until he calls us home. It's as simple as that. Uh. So he says, have you not put that hedge around him that Carl's talking about right now? And his household and everything he has. You have blessed the work of Job's hands. So that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. That means he was also very wealthy. But stretch out your hand. Strike everything he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan. Very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. Basically, it's your world right now. You're the prince of it. That's what Jesus said. He's the prince of this world. We're living in Satan's world. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And you know what Satan had to say right there? Yes, sir. Satan's powerful. He's way more powerful than we are. But he ain't God. He doesn't even come close to God. He's a created being. But God's letting this whole story play out, and we're right in the middle of it. But he's got it all fixed. So now, let me just... Let me just tell you this. So Job had sons and daughters and flocks and herds, camels, oxen, sheep. He was wealthy. Had a great wife. And, 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 and chapter 1 goes on to talk about how things, and, and it just tells it quickly. We don't really know all the time frames and exactly when, what happened when, but, but it talks about how his children, they were all grown and fine looking girls and guys and the oldest brother decided to have a big party in his house, and it says, and they were, you know, dancing and drinking. So I'm, I'm guessing some drunkenness went with it. So they, were, they decided to have a big blowout in his house, and so they did. They're grown adults. But in the meantime, most Bible translations say a huge wind, a gigantic wind. More than likely, a lot of scholars believe some kind of tornadic activity. 2006, there was a F2 tornado that went through Western Galilee, did tons of damage and injured, I don't know, about 100 people badly. And so they're very rare in the Middle East and particularly in Israel, but they do happen. And when they do, people are not prepared. Now, this is thousands of years ago. It didn't have early warning systems, okay? Phones that went beep, 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 tornado coming. Take shelter now. You didn't have anything. And they got hit. A messenger came from that party and went to Job and said, all of your sons and daughters were killed. All of them. The house collapsed on them. Stuff like that still happens in our world. The news reports it almost every day somewhere. And it's not just that. It's volcanoes and it's earthquakes and it's hurricanes and on and on. Floods. There are a lot of people that live this. 
This is not just some story, some Bible story. It's an account. It may be an allegory, but no one really knows. We weren't there, but it, it doesn't matter. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, now, this account is true exactly as it happened. It, but, but even if it's an allegory, all of the theological points are correct, and the message is correct. It doesn't matter. Bottom line is, 65 times in the Old Testament, that book is quoted. Four or five times in the New Testament, that book is quoted, and Job's name is mentioned as an example. So the roof collapses, kills all of his kids. I, ca I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine that. I'm just going to say this and go on because it may still have some tough stuff for people that might remember it. I, I have ministered in a situation where, like, all the kids in a family were killed. I have done that since I've been here at once. I've, I, I've been a part of ministering like that. I've never experienced that. I can't even imagine experiencing it. But ministering in the midst of it just about ripped my heart out and shoved it down my throat. That's what we're reading here. Then it goes on to say that thieves, bands of, <laughs> boy, we could extrapolate this to our, illegal aliens came rushing into the area, went into his herds, stole them all, killed, slaughtered, destroyed, and or stole them. That was his wealth. It's like somebody breaking into a safe deposit box in his bank accounts and wiping them clean very soon after he'd lost all of his children. <sighs> so the man is bankrupt after being very wealthy. All of his precious children are gone. He's left with his wife, who's a good woman. But somewhere in the midst of his pain and his suffering, in the midst of the friends coming, his wife turns and says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? <sighs> when the love of your life, the only one that supports you in the whole world, says that to you, how deep and dark and depressed could you go? How much liquor could you drink to take that away? How many pills could you pop to take that pain away? You see how relevant all this is? By the way, when she said those words, those are found in chapter 1 in the first few verses we just read. When Satan came, you start taking stuff. Will you let me take stuff away from him? He will curse you to your face. Satan entered into his wife's heart that had blackened with anger at God. And she spoke Satan's words in the face of her husband. Are y'all feeling this? Relevant yet? Mm, maybe not to you personally, and I pray not, but it's relevant to this world. It's relevant to life. It's relevant to living in Satan's world. Our battle is not against flesh and blood often, but it is against powers, principalities in the unseen realms. Ephesians 6. It's right there in the New Testament. Refers, basically, if you will, there's, there's images in my mind whenever I read that all the way back to Job where you see it working out. Everybody with me? All right. So after all of that happens, look at verse 20. Yeah, verse 20 of chapter 1. So after all of this, he loses everything. Job got up and tore his robe, a sign of grief and despair. He shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and cursed God. Fell to the ground and worship in worship. Now, before you get to thinking, wow, what a mature, godly man. He was mature and he was godly. He's used as that example throughout the scriptures. But you'll see, he caves, he folds. As he gets deeper and darker, he's just a man. He's, he doesn't have a big ass on his t-shirts. 
But right here, his first reaction is to worship. And this is what he says. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart this world. The Lord gave, and now the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know what he just said there? Baruch Hashem Adonai. The Lord gives and takes away. Hey, there's a modern praise song. We sing it here all the time. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. I'm not going to sing it, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And it goes, he gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. You remember that? You know where that comes from? Right there. A modern praise song sung in modern churches in 2024. We sing it all the time here. It comes right out of the oldest piece of literature known to humanity. And Job's reaction. Every time we sing that song and it says he gives and takes away. I, I, I can think of my own life. Nothing as drastic as this. but And I praise him for that. But I always think of that passage, always, because I, I, mean, I know that passage and I know what it's saying. And when we sing that song, I remember the first time we sang it in here, I thought, oh, my gosh, that comes right out of Job. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? But watch this. Now, go to <laughs> go to chapter chapter 10. And just hang there for a moment. Chapter 10. See, what happens is, he's got three friends. Eliphaz, Bel Bildad, and Zophar. Eliphaz, these are his three friends. By the time you read the book, you think, <laughs> some friends. But, I mean, some of the stuff they say is correct and comforting. Eliphaz, though, let me, if I'm just going to paraphrase and give a synopsis of each of their personalities and how they handle their counseling, Eliphaz hits Job with the ultra supernatural, you know, I've dreams and visions. And if you, if you were as mature as me, then God would speak to you like that. And then you would know. Then you would know like I know. It's like, gag me. And, I, and I'm sure Job felt that way, too. I mean, you're hurting. You're crushed. You don't want to hear how, how spiritual somebody else is and their dreams and visions at that point. And, you know, that might come in handy later on. But right now you're hurting. You're crushed. You're, you're confused, even a little angry at life and maybe even God himself, as you will hear Job slip into that. Bildad, he's a man of... He's a man of platitudes. You know. Well, you know, God never put anything on you more than you can bear. That's in the Bible, you know. Actually, it's not. What it says is, there is no temptation that has seized you, that God has not made a way out for you. But Bill Dab was that kind of guy. Well, you know, they say, who's they? Well, they've got an office in downtown Atlanta. There's a skyscraper. It says they. <laughs> a lot of people refer to this mysterious they. Oh, you know. Well, you know, they say. But, 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 hold it. Stop. Before you start preaching to me, tell me who they are. There's a lot of they's around here now. In fact, we've got even singular people walking around calling themselves they. <laughs> so, I mean, we need to know who is this they of whom you speak. Okay, <laughs> it's like Jesus casting out the demons and the and the guys in the in the cemetery. Who are you? You know what is your name? My name is Legion because I am many. Came out of one man's mouth. I am they. Interesting, isn't it? So these guys. Oh yeah, yeah. I left off so far. Yeah, so far. Uh, so far was. Um, he was one of these guys that he just came across as knowing it all. Not, not just about life, but he knew the mind of God. Now, here's what God would tell you if he was here. You know, it's like, who died and made you God? 
So that's kind of a synopsis of their personalities and the advice they gave. Now, now all three of them gave points of truth and little comfort here and there and some more than others, but that's basically, I don't know about y'all, but, but you've ever had friends like that, <laughs> counseling like that, you know? Well, see, this book is very relevant, isn't it? Human nature hasn't changed. Very little pain, suffering, the loss, the horrible loss of friends, family, even children, loved ones, spouses, I, all of that, the loss of wealth, the devastation of life. The only thing that's changed from thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago now to now is technology. So humans are the same. We act a little differently, live a little differently because of technology. But our, the human heart is the same. The human mind is the way it thinks and the things it reacts to and the emotions and what makes us angry. Pretty much the same. Amen? This book deals with all of that. So these three guys come to him through, throughout the book till you get almost to the end. And I'm not going to go through and read them all. I encourage you to. I think you'll enjoy it. It's good reading. Uh, but and they go through all of this. Job has dialogues with them. He answers. And some of them, they start asking him, you must have some sin in your life. Confess your sin. And then <laughs> Job just says, well, I'm not perfect, but here are the things I, I haven't done. And you, you, you'll enjoy reading it. But now we come to chapter 10. Because in chapter 10... Job gets really dark and depressed. He's just being pummeled by his friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free rein to my complaint. I will speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. But tell me, what charges you have against me? What's he doing? He's blaming it on God. He's, he's in that stage of anger now. you got to blame somebody. In this case, almost everything was out of his control. He couldn't help the raiders coming across the borders and stealing everything. I mean, what could he do about it? He couldn't stop a tornado. And, from, and even if he could, how would he know to stop it from hitting that house? And, you know, this, it was out of his control, so it must be God, Right? I will say to God, do not condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. Really? Really? <laughs> Does it please you, God, to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? Do you think God does that? But Job is depressed. He is hurting. Do you see as a mortal sees? Well, Actually, he saw that from a cross, yeah, but we'll talk about that later. Are your days like those of a mortal, or are your years like those of a man, that you must search out my faults and probe after my sin, though you know that I'm not guilty, <laughs> and that no one can rescue me from your hand? Your hand shaped me. They made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life, you showed me kindness, and in your providence watched over my spirit. But this is what you concealed in your heart. And I know this was in your mind. Wow. <laughs> I'd be afraid of lightning right about that time. Verse 14, if I sinned, you would be watching me, and you would not let my offense go unpunished. And today, to this very day, a lot of people who call themselves unbelievers, this is how they think and this is how they talk about the things of God. And they picture God as some larger human being. He's so other. He's so holy. He's so unbelievable but they picture him as just a large human being sitting up there looking at, and looking for a way to bash us over the head with a baseball bat that's basically what job just said you're just up there watching me you're waiting for me to stumble you just want to beat me down and now you've beat me down i can't figure why it is and and so this must have been your plan from all along you planned this for me 
You're messing with me. You're, I'm mad at you. I loathe my life. The life you gave me, I hate it. Is that not what he said? Let's continue in chapter 38 because he goes on. And as I said, I don't have time to read it all, but you guys can read it. Go to chapter 38. So after all of that, it goes back and forth, and even the friends step in here and there. Job is clearly mad at God, feeling better about himself because he's telling God off. He's telling off his creator, the one that makes his heart beat and has his next breath. He's given him the what for. Chapter 38. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the storm that surrounded him. And he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself, Job, like a man. I will question you now, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or where were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone? While the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, the angels, the morning stars, sang together. And all of those angels shouted for joy. Were you there? Verse 8. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said to the sea, this far you may come and no further? Here is where your proud waves halt. Can you do that, Job? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges? And one day, shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you even seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born, weren't you? You've lived for so many years. (laughs) Go to chapter 40. We'll look at the first 14 verses. The Lord's continuing to speak to Job. The Lord said to Job, So will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord. I am unworthy, Lord. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I did speak once, but I don't have an answer now. Twice, and I'm going to say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man, Job. I'm going to question you one more time, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Does that sound like anything you hear in the news every day? 
well, God made me this way. That's why I am. There's nothing you can say about it. Bah, 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 you know, on and on. It's always God's fault. You know the God they don't believe in? Until they need to. Then it's his fault. He's never the provider. He's never the blesser. He's never the one to give praise to. He's never the one considered that maybe he's letting your heart beat and your breath flow from your lungs. He's always the one that we condemn first. And when I say always and we, I, I, you know, I'm exaggerating that maybe some prayerfully for all of us. I don't always blame God, and most of you don't either. But there are an awful of the billions of people in the world. There are an awful lot that do just like this. Verse 9. Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like his? And then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at every proud man and bring them low. Look at every proud man and humble him. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them in all the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Listen to me. Remember the PowerPoint I did in Isaiah 52.10? Look at the outstretched arms of Yahweh. And then you will see his salvation. See, he just said, you can't stretch out your arms and save anybody. And the connotation here is, but I can stretch out mine. And I will. Oh, but it gets better than this. You'll see in just a few moments. But you're going to see little hints of the gospel through there. And you say, well, you're looking kind of hard to find that. No, not when you know the whole book of Job, you're not. You'll see. But there's that. Now go to chapter 42. I'm skipping a lot, but it's all in context. You go home and read the whole thing. Then Job replied to the Lord, O oh Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask me, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Yes, Lord. Surely I spoke of things that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to even know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, Lord. But now, in the storm, my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is correct as my servant Job has. In other words, Job messed up too, but he's saying even Job that messed up a lot didn't get it as wrong as you guys. Verse 8. So now take seven bulls and seven rams. That's a blood offering. That's a covenant. And go to my servant Job. Job's going to serve as a priest to them. And sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you. And I will accept his prayer. And I will not deal with you according to your folly. In other words, it's, I'll deal with you with grace and mercy. This is like the Feast of Atonement. If you've sacrificed and come under the blood, and you've gone to the one I've appointed as the great high priest, in this case it's Jesus Christ now, and he has prayed for you properly. And of course, Jesus did by going all the way to the cross. He said, then my wrath will pass over you. But if you're not under the blood and you and the high priest don't do anything correct because it's all going to point to Jesus. 
then you will die as the wicked die. You say, Carl, that's a little harsh. Let me remind you of Jesus' first sermon, Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who just says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of the Father. Everybody with me? Keep reading chapter 42. Look at verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, <laughs> you can put friends in quotes, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. And we hear about that. But here's what I want you to know. Look at verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named, and then he goes through the names. Nowhere in the land were they found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children, their children, to the fourth generation. And so he died, old and full of years. Watch. God did not release the blessing on Job's life until Job prayed for his friends. I could preach a whole sermon on that. I'll let the Holy Spirit make that application in your own life. That's why Jesus taught so much about bitterness and anger and forgiveness. And Some people won't let you forgive them, so you have to do what I call one-way forgiveness. <laughs> Just take it before the Lord. Say, Lord, I forgive them before you. They won't even speak to me. They hate my guts. They'd probably kill me if they saw me. I don't know what else to do. But I promise you, Lord, if their heart ever changes and they come to me and say, Carl, would you come pray with me? Would you come help me? I will be there. I forgive them before you, Lord. I do that a lot in my own life. That's one way you can deal with that. Because sometimes people will use the convenient excuse, well, they won't even let me forgive them. So I, that means I don't have to forgive them. If you want to be blessed by God, you do. Old and New Testament said the oldest book in the world says that. You want God's blessings? Deal with your own heart. Deal with your own heart, even the tough work of ministry, and He will bless you. Do you need things, good things, released in your life that seem to have not been? Um, you need to release some things at least before the Lord that you've been hanging on to and petting. And those things are sitting at the feet of Satan, and you're petting on them. And they have bit you over and over again, you still pet them. God says, stop that. Release it before me. Forgive, even if it has to be one way forgiveness, forgive. Pray for them. Even if they hate you, still pray for them every now and then. Just pray for them. And I will release to you what Satan has stolen from you. That's God's word, folks. That's not just me saying some pretty words. They are pretty words, but man, they're hard to do. Amen? But there's a promise that goes with it. I want you to turn now. We're going to go backwards. I want you to turn to chapter 13, verse 15. So, so Job is talking. He's talking to Zophar. <laughs> Job's had about enough of him. And Job says, keep silent and let me speak, Zophar. You know, Zophar is the one that knows everything and knows God's mind. And then he says, keep silent and let me speak. Then let, then, then let come to me what may. What do, why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? Let me tell you something, Zophar. Though he slay me. Yet will I hope in him. Now, now, guys, you've heard me paraphrase that quote a lot through my ministry here with you. I had to, to live it. I've had to keep that own promise in my own life. 
And basically, I, I sometimes at the offering, I say this in my prayers and to you, sometimes I will say, listen, we're not giving so we get something. I'm going to put my offering plate and God's going to make me rich. No, we give because he first gave to us. It doesn't matter if he never gives me another thing. If I've got a dollar, I'll take a dime at least, that's a tenth, and give it. Well, well, but he's not blessing you back. He, I, I'm not in it for that. Well, what if you get sick and die? Well, one day I might. But you know what? I'm going to keep my hope in him, my faith in him. And let me, let me just put it like this. This sounds almost like, you know, you're justifying this attitude. But, but think about it. Like the scripture says, like this praise song we sing. To whom else would we go? To whom else would we turn? There's none like you, Lord. What, am I going to serve Satan all my life? Can he give me eternal life and make me joint heirs with all he's created? Oh, that's right. He's created nothing. Does he have power over life and death? No. So am I going to serve, am I going to serve this world? Because, you know, this world's got it together. Yeah. Am I going to serve the politics and the political correctness of this world? Because once they settle it, it never changes. <laughs> No. Well, who do we go to? Our Creator, the one that gave us life and still gives us life. And if we're under His blood and filled with His Holy Spirit, gives us direction and wisdom and instructions and, and love and healing and freedom and the breaking of chains and, and on and on and on it goes. I don't care if he kills me today until I take my last breath. I will put my hope in him. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. That's a PowerPoint. I think, I think Joshua drew from that the day they entered the promised land. When he said, you can serve all those gods of your forefathers if you want. And it's a little G. And it's the fallen angels presenting themselves as gods. And that's why the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods. And that word is Elohim. And when it's used that way, that means the evil ones that fell. And then the second commandment is, and don't make landing pads for them either. Some of you got that. Others of you have never read the Ten Commandments. But anyway... <laughs> You should not make, in the King James, the way I memorized it, you shall not make any graven images, that is, images that have been carved to make anything, any physical thing that you can pray over or invite the gods to come. You build it, they will come. Y'all with me? It's not the field of dreams, it's the field of demons. You build it, you pray, there's nothing. Nothing in a Ouija board that has power. But you gather around it and start chanting and asking for the demons to show up, and you're dead serious about it, and you just, you know, that's, you're consumed with it. Guess what will show up? That's what God's word says witchcraft, sorcery, flee from it. That's what I'm talking about. That's why Joshua said, either you, you serve the Gods of our forefathers, if you want, we're coming into land, but it's for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh. In other words, I don't care. Well, he, well, you might die. He might take his hand. You might, I, even if he slays me, I'm serving him. Does that make sense? That's Job. Now I want to show you something that we're going to close with. I love this. Now turn to chapter 19, verse 23. Job is speaking again. Zophar is getting ready to speak, but Job is, he's just, verse 23, he said, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll. Oh, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives. And give the Lord a hand. And, and that in the end of it all, that's in the last of the last days, He will stand upon the earth. Who's He talking about? Jesus is called the Redeemer all through the New Testament. God calls Himself the Redeemer and then calls Himself Jesus. Yes, when He says, I am your salvation. The word salvation is Yeshua, which is 
the name of Jesus. I am your Jesus. I am your light. I am your salvation. I am your redeemer. I am the first and the last. I am the Aleph and the Tav. Jesus tells us in the New Testament, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I am your Redeemer. I am God in the flesh. John starts off his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, the Redeemer, and dwelt among us. And all who called upon him, to them he gave the right to once again be called B'nai Elohim. Enter into paradise, into your blessing. I'm not done yet. I know that my Redeemer lives. How could Job? The oldest book in the world speaks of God who created and God who's going to put his foot on the earth. Jesus will have done that twice. He was done it the first time to go to the cross and the world saw him and the world still sees him through the historical. Every time you sign a check, you're attesting to the Christ event 2024. I mean, we still see it. Every time the word's preached and exalted and the Holy Spirit fills it, we still see it. The day God stepped on this planet and delivered himself to a cross. Job, the oldest or one of the handful of oldest books on the planet. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I will see him. He will set his foot on the earth. Keep reading. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end of it all, there's the second coming. He will stand upon the earth. Watch this. After my skin, that's the earthly skin, the vehicle he was loaned has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. You know what he's saying? Basically, the Apostle Paul said the same thing when he was caught up to heaven. He said, I don't know if it's in my body or out of a body, but I was there. And what he's saying is, I looked and I had hands. There was a pool of water over here. I looked and there was me. I, I, I had a body. I could feel. I could smell. I could hear. I could see. I, I, could, I could feel my when I touched it. But I know that this flesh and blood corrupt body coming from the world. I know I stepped through a portal. I know I went through a dimension. And this is real as it gets. It's more real than what I left. But yet I'm in a body. I know it's me. That's what Job's trying to describe. He says, when my flesh and skin is gone, that is what God gave me for earth, I will still stand before him and I will have a body and I will be me. I will be me, the oldest book on the planet, one of the oldest. He's preaching the gospel here, y'all. And look at verse 27. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. That, that What he means is other people will see him, and he doesn't mean that. What he's saying is, I will see him. Somebody else is not going to have to see him for me and tell me about him. I will see him with my own eyes. I will see him and not another who's got to tell me. I will see him. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Folks, I'm telling you, I pray that nothing like what happened to Job happens to you. Some of you, maybe it already has or come near it. And I've ministered to people in this community in my 37, going on 38 years now, that have been right up to the edges of all this. And I've watched the stages of grief, and I've ministered to people. I've tried not to be either one of those three friends because I am a perfect pastor. I never get anything wrong when I minister to people. <laughs> it's a struggle. It's the hard work of the ministry. But you got to stay in the word without being preachy. You got to give comfort without giving little platitudes. You got to you got to give perspective when sometimes they can't even con conceive perspective. You've got to gently love them out of being angry at God. And you can't be quoting Job to them now. I mean not then, not then a little later on maybe, but not not right there. You, you better shut up. God's going to come to you. I mean, you're going to repent in dust and ashes. Now, I mean, that's, that's so far right there. You know, knows everything, knows the mind of God. It's hard work, but it's satisfying work. And the Holy Spirit will lead you if your heart is right. 
And God will bless you. He said that when he prayed for his friends. God blessed him. Well, when you minister to people, brothers, sisters in Christ that are hurting, and you pray for them, God will bless you too. You don't do it for that reason. That's why I've said before, I don't care. If, if I put my offering in this morning, God never blesses me financially again. And he has blessed me financially down through the years. Me and my wife, we've tried to be faithful, and he's taken care of us even in tough times. We realize, wow, the hand of God is still blessing. We can still pay that bill. We can still do this. We can still eat this week. <laughs> Praise God. But, 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 but I'm always praying. But even if you never do that again, if I have to eat out of a trash can, I'll be thanking you when I find a piece of food in the bottom of it. Not that I'm Mr. Perfect, but I, I know the word and I know what God says. And I have often tried to keep those perspectives in mind. My wife and I talk about these things. And we say, well, you know, the Lord's really, really blessing this and that and our lives right now or this or that. And then we say, but, you know, if he takes it all away, we're still going to serve him. And what we're doing is we're quoting Job. You can give the Lord a hand. And I know many of you are the same way. I'm not presenting myself as some, you know, super spiritual better than anybody. No, I'm, I'm just trying to do this walk with you. And I'm telling you, the oldest book known to humanity, one of the very top oldest books, only found in the Word of God it's all about all of this, theology and suffering and spiritual warfare and multiple dimensions of reality and creation and God loving us and desiring to have a personal relationship even if He has to chew us out and shake us up to get us to listen to Him. Like my wife and I do to our grandchildren. We, you know, they're running around. We say, look at me. Look at me. But I don't want to look at me. And then they do, and they're just like, I'm, I'm standing before God, you know. You know, that's, sometimes God has to do that to us. Or else we just go off in our own mind and spin off out into outer space. But what we just read, circle it, mark it, somehow mark it. Because what he is describing, the outstretched arms, God in the flesh, on the planet, on the planet again at the end of the days, I will see him, I in my body and in my flesh. I will not die, I will live, even when I leave this dimension. I mean, it's all right, they're packed into that. But you know what? Not only does that go right to Isaiah 52, 10, where it says the outstretched arms of the Lord will demonstrate to the world. And the whole world will then see his salvation. That's basically what Job is saying. And don't forget the word Yeshua. The name we exalt in this place. Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Jesus. Adonai, Melech HaOlom. Lord and King of eternity. Why do, why do we exalt that name? Because watch, don't forget that name. Yudshin Wa'ain. That's how you spell it in Hebrew. Those are the Hebrew letters. Yudshin Wa'ain. You can almost hear Yeshua. Yudshin Wa'ain. Yeshua. Remember in the ideograms of the Hebrew language that goes all the way back to the most ancient days. Again, I remind you, even Haaretz, the main newspaper of Israel, in 2014 wrote a whole article about the Hebrew alphabet. And today, those letters each still have an ideogram, an idea attached to them, a meaning attached to them. And then they said the honest thing in today's modern world. They said, that's not really important for speaking or using or writing or reading Hebrew. You never even have to think about it if you don't want to, but it's there. That was in 2014. Now, I emphasize that because you see people on the Internet that will say, oh, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. That, that, they don't even use that anymore. They, it never really was there, and you're just crazy. Uh, those people are crazy. They don't want you to see what God wants you to see because yud shin wa ayin. Yud means the hands or the outstretched arms. Sheen looks like a W in English, but it's not. It's on every Hebrew mezuzah, the little prayer box that the Jews will often put in some Christians on their homes and their businesses. The sheen by itself stands for El Shaddai, God Almighty. The outstretched hands and arms of El Shaddai 
La means the nail or the spear. The outstretched arms of God Almighty, El Shaddai, will take the nails and take the spear. Ayin, it means to see, but not only to see, to see God's salvation. His name literally says, Yuchin wa Ayin, the hands and outstretched arms of God Almighty El Shaddai, he'll take the nails so that you can see the salvation of God. Job says, and with his outstretched arms, I will see his salvation, and my Redeemer will live. He will step on this earth in the last days. He will put his foot here, and I will see the salvation of God. Isaiah 52.10 backs it up. The whole New Testament backs it up. The gospel is in Job. The creation is in Job. Spiritual warfare is in Job. The practicality of pain and suffering and life to the greatest depths. I mean, they, I mean, who, when, when God anointed this book to be written by whoever the author was and be used since the ancient days and quoted 65 times in the Tanakh in the, in, in the Old Testament, I mean, they, they put Job in a situation that very few people on the planet have experienced. Some have. But it's unthinkable to the vast majority of us. And then we get to see how Job deals with it and how his friends try to deal with it. I mean, this is a practical book. And I'm telling you, I'm going to say this again. There's no other book on the planet that has it. No other religious book on the planet. And it's one of the oldest pieces of literature known to man and is right smack dab in the middle. It's right before you come to Psalms. And it basically tells you everything you need. It agrees with Philippians 3. It agrees with Romans 8.28. All, I've got that on my bracelet here. Romans 8.28. And all things work together for good eventually for those who know and love the Lord. I just want to give you some perspective. Life is tough regardless of whether we're living in prophetic times, but it just happens to be that we're living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus. And so in a lot of ways, it's even tougher in a lot of ways. Some more perspective. I told you weeks ago I was going to preach three or four or five messages on perspective. Bottom line is I've wanted to give you some perspective because we're just going to do life and we're going to do it with a smile on our face as much as we can and to people who can't put a smile on their face going through this we come along beside them we try not to be one of those three friends we give them our love we just pray for them we hold them we cry when they cry we laugh when they laugh and we assure them i know you don't see it i'm not going to give you any platitudes but the whole word of God screams at us. God's got this. He does. You will see one day. Right now, let's just cry together. Let me just sit here with you. It's called life. We pray even for those who have messed over us or have given us bad advice. We pray for them. You know what God does? He said, I can bless that. You saw it right there. It's a teaching of Job. So I pray that today you've drawn a little closer to the Word of God. You've drawn a little closer to the mind and to the heart of God. For those of you that are here this morning, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I pray that before this day is over, you would. He's all through the Scriptures from the first word of the first verse. And I've preached on that, and I won't do it again now. Even in the spelling of His name, the letters, it's all there. Through the hands of the outstretched God who took the nails and the spear, we saw the salvation of God in Yeshua. Hamashiach means the Christ, the, the Messiah, the Lord, Yeshua, the Christ, the Lord, Adonai, the Lord. It's all there. Even in the oldest piece of literature on the planet, it's all right there. Now do you know why other religious books don't include it? 
I'm, I'm telling you, all the way through to the final words of the book of Revelation. So if today you're saying, I need to be saved, I need to know Jesus, I need to be right with him, I quote this all the time, Romans 10, 9, if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means to a prayer minister, to somebody, to a friend, just any time from this point forward, don't deny him, don't be ashamed of him, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan's not, the political correctness of this world system's not, your friends are not. The things that you treasure in your life, they're not Lord. Confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead so that we might live. And you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. And all who call upon the name of the Lord. Say it with me. Shall be saved. Y'all give the Lord a big old hand of praise. I pray that today would be the day of your salvation. Today would be the day of your deliverance if you have chains that need to be broken. Today might be the day of your coming back to Him as a prodigal son or daughter. That today might be the day that this Word, the Holy Spirit, has brought, a, brought alive in your life, and now you see a way out of what you didn't think you saw before. I pray that today might be a day when God's power is released in you because you'll start living some of these principles. If the Lord slays me, I still will serve Him. I know that I will not die and I will live and I will see him in the flesh. I will pray for people around me and I know God will bless me. And I also know that though he slay me, yet my hope will stay in him. Let's pray together. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. The Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.